blesses you, I know that he's going to. We're going we're gonna to worship the Lord today. We're going to just sing some praises to him. You're all invited to join us and to, to just let this moment, let tonight be a time between you and the Lord uh, where we can really turn our hearts and our minds toward him. So uh, would you pray with me? And then we'll stand and sing. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, God, for the rain that you've given us. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the blessings that you have poured out on us. And Lord, we thank you for tonight. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would just work in our hearts. We pray, God, that you would just lead us and guide us, Father, as, as you teach us and as you inspire us, and, and Lord, as you direct us. And we just uh, thank you for the fellowship tonight, uh, the chance to get together and to, to have uh, just a, a wonderful company with each other, Lord, and to, to be an encouragement uh, for each other. And we just pray, God, that you just be with each person who's here tonight, that you would bless them, bless their family, bless their homes. Uh, Father, we pray that you'd be with them, Lord, as we, as we follow you throughout the, throughout the weekend and, uh, Father, in the year ahead. We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Lord, is that make it on time? Did I make it on time? Has it started yet? Has it started yet? Uh, I, I gotta make it no, on time. We haven't really started. Come oh, on, come on. Oh, yeah. oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <sighs> well, my name is Edith. I, I just came up here from Oklahoma to, uh, to hear my you niece. You can have speak a seat tonight. if you want. Hi there. Howdy. Howdy. Oh, I've seen you before. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Looky here. Looky here. I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, listen, I didn't know for sure how to get here. And my grandchildren they said, well, Nana, just ask Siri and she'll tell you. Now, I don't know who this Siri character is, but I thought, well, I'll give it a try. I said, Siri, how do you get to Parkview Christian Church in Springfield, Missouri? And she said, go to Bass Pro and turn left. <laughs> well, I said, well, okay, how do I get to Bass Pro? And she laughed at me. Does everybody know how to get to Bass Pro? Yeah, yeah she does. I know she does. Yes, sir. Well, you know, I, she finally sent me down this I-44. Man, that is a busy place out there. Well, I had my old Cadillac all speeding down at 50 miles an hour, and they were just whizzing right by me. And, you know, they were a friendly lot, though. But they, they really, they were kind of waved a little funny in Missouri. Because, you know, in Oklahoma, we use all of our fingers. <laughs> but, you know, went in wrong, so I just waved right back. <laughs> But, you know, you do have kind of a, a good location here right down the street from the redneck capital of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, is your pastor here today? Oh, so I'll bet you get a lot of tourists on Sunday mornings down there for, down from there, don't you? Uh, well, we get a few, yeah. A few? Get a few, yeah. Well, you know, maybe if you put a big fish on the, on the roof, <laughs> maybe that would work. Oh, no, 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 I got it. Why don't you, why don't you build a pond out here and, and just stock it with some nice trout? <laughs> yeah. I'll bet that would bring them in. That would do it, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, sir. I'll bet it would. And, you know, just Jesus hung out with fishermen. He did? He did, yeah. 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 So just trying to be a blessing, trying yeah. to be a blessing. You know, you know, I got one of these here smartphones. My, grand, my kids made me get one. I don't know why they call it a smartphone. It makes me feel like an idiot every time I use it. <laughs> but anyway, our pastor, he says on Sunday morning, he says, if you have a, 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 a quote or comment or, or a question on Sunday morning, well, well, you can just text me. And I thought, okay. So I did. I said, wrap it up, pastor. The Baptists are going to beat us to Golden Corral. <laughs> <laughs> well. That was you? That was me. <laughs> 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 yeah, he did. He said that wasn't what he was what he was thinking. But but you know, I, I'm I'm just I better go back and find me a, a seat and let you all let you all keep singing. But you know, I got my Hallelujah hanky already. Y'all know what Hallelujah hankies are, don't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll bet you get a lot of Hallelujah hankies on Sunday morning. Not so, enough of them. Well, not enough. Hmm. Well, that is unfortunate. We need to pass out more hankies. Maybe you should spend a little more time on your sermon. That's true. <laughs> Maybe That's that would true. work. <laughs> anyway, well, I'm going to get on out of here so you young people can, can go ahead and, and, and sing and, and we'll just be worshiping together. But I'm just so excited. So, so <laughs> carry on, carry on. <laughs>
sun to rise every morning colors the sky with the shades of his glory he meets us with mercy and love Jesus does who holds the orphan comforts the widow cries for injustice heals every sorrow his children, Jesus loves. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was, because that's what Jesus loves. Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus does. Oh, what a friend! Oh, what a Savior! He's always been good. He's always been. Son, and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. And I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. And praise to the Spirit who's living in us. And I was a sinner, He saved me from who sing praise to the Father. We sing praise to your Spirit. We thank you for living inside us, for moving and working inside us. We know that you are working right now in our lives. You are moving. You are changing us. You are restoring us to that perfect union with you, God. God, we lay our lives down today we just want to trust you with the future. We want to trust you with this moment, with the present, and we want to trust you for your plan for our lives in the future, God. We give this night and this day to you in Jesus' name. Letting go of everything. Oh, yeah. 
king of the fight. No matter what I face, you're by my side. When you don't move the mountains, I'm needing you to move. When you don't part the waters, I wish I could walk through. When you don't give the answers, as I cry out to you, I will trust, I will trust, I will trust in you. thank all of you for being here today and uh, for just uh, spending some time with us as we uh, as we give a night to the Lord and that's really what we're doing tonight we're giving it to the Lord and uh, and I'm going to turn it over to these ladies who have done such a fantastic job of preparing all this for you and uh, and I wanted to uh, first uh, just I think introduce Donna if uh, she could say a few words and just uh, we want to thank all of you for being here at Parkview Christian Church today. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. There's a lot of people here that don't know me. I am Donna. Um, I'm kind of the new kid on the block around, um, maybe not the newest member, but one of the few. Um, I enjoy doing this. It's, you know, it takes a team of everybody to do it. We thank everybody for coming in this miserable, miserable weather. Um, we have door prizes, if everybody didn't get it, the ladies, didn't get a ticket when they came in, there is some in the back that Joyce has, 
Um, and we are doing a love offering for Sharon. There are envelopes, love offering envelopes in the front of the pews, and there is a basket in the back where the handsome Bruce is sitting. Um, you can just put it in there. There are raffle tickets for that beautiful quilt that's in the back. Um, there are, I believe, $5 for one and three for five, something like that. Um, head on back and Bruce will help you out with that too. Um, I would like to say a few words, I guess, about Sharon. Um, Sharon and her husband John have been married for 46 years and have three children. Lori, who is a special needs adult, two sons, Jeremy and Jacob, two daughter-in-laws, Libby and Holly, and four grandchildren. Sharon taught kindergarten for 20 years before going into administration as an elementary principal for 15 more years. She recently retired and now enjoys volunteering at the church, subbing at the school, and being able to study and share the Bibles with others, the Bible with others. I'd like to, after I take my glasses off, I'd like to welcome Sharon Pruitt, um, who was also AKA Edith, no. if we didn't figure that out. <laughs> um, and then just so everybody knows, at the end, um, when she is complete and girls come back up here, we're gonna do some raffle tickets, so don't leave. We have plenty of refreshments in the back, coffee, water, tea, and lots of cookies and stuff. So feel free to go in the back, but don't leave because we got these awesome door prizes. Any questions? Welcome to Sharon. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I don't know what you're talking about with this whole Aunt Edith thing. I, you know, she, she's embarrassing. I wouldn't have anything to do with her if I were you. you know? So, yeah, apologize. Apologize for anything she might have said. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited that you're here. And like she said, it's a horrible, horrible weather we've had. You probably, some of you had to probably boat here. And, oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, that's my family back there. Oh, hi family. You, my family is the biggest liars that ever lived. I'm just gonna tell you, because they were not supposed to be here. Michelle even texted me. <laughs> okay, well, let's get on with it then. <laughs> well, let me do I, just a little bit of a disclaimer here before I speak. I am a much better writer than I am a speaker. Um, because if I say something stupid when I write, there's this marvelous little thing called a delete button, and I have yet to find a delete button for my mouth. So <laughs> I just, I just want to warn you uh, at all. Uh, at the very end, I will give you the address to my blog, which I don't, I'm not very consistent in writing in it, but there's about 13 years worth of stuff in there if you want to read some more of my stuff. But anyway, you know, you know in 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul says he's not, he can't speak with wisdom or eloquence. So and he wrote 13 books of the Bible, so I guess I'm in good company tonight. So, so we'll, we'll move on with that. Um, would you pray real quick with me, please? Heavenly Father, we just pray um, that you would help me to just get out of the way and that your word would be spoken here tonight, um, that you would be glorified, Lord, and that um, we can all take something from this evening tonight and um, draw closer to you because of it. We just pray all these things in your name. Amen. Well, what do you do when you have plans for your life and they don't turn out the way you thought? What do you, when um, you thought you'd be married by now, but Mr. Wright hasn't showed up? Or you thought your marriage would be the fairy tale that you imagined, but um, it's not. Uh, when you said, I do, it just, it didn't turn out that way. Or you thought you'd have a family by now, but that pregnancy test just keeps coming up negative. Or you thought you got a diagnosis that included a prognosis that wasn't very positive. Or you thought you'd spend your life together, but he or she left this world without you. Um, so what do you do when those things happen? Well, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I've got all the answers, because I certainly don't. Um, but God does. And so we're going to trust that, that God's going to speak um, through me, and that we can learn a little bit about what do we do when those things happen. Well, let me start by telling a little bit of my story. And I promise I won't go back to uh, when I was born. But we are going to go back to... <laughs> no, we'd be here. <laughs> yeah, scroll, scroll, scroll. Yeah. <laughs> but we were gonna, are going to go back to uh, 1979. 
And uh, the baby that we had hoped for and planned for and dreamed about came screaming into the world on a warm June morning. Um, she wasn't the prettiest baby I'd ever seen in my life, but she was ours and we were thrilled. And I had plans. I had an elementary education degree in my pop back pocket and a head full of knowledge and that was going to guarantee that my baby girl was going to have every advantage that life could give her. And then we left the hospital. <laughs> and things began to fall apart. Lori was not a happy baby. She cried nonstop, maybe slept 15 minutes at a time, day and night. Um, it, was, it was a bad time. She only stopped crying when I stuck a bottle in her mouth. And I called the doctor so many times, I think they knew my voice when, when, I, when I called them. Um, but I was exhausted, and I was frustrated, and I was willing to do anything to make her happy. Well, then one day, I took her to where John was working, and one of his coworkers, who was an older woman, which now that I think about it, she's probably younger than I am now, so I don't know. <laughs> that, that older person thing probably doesn't work anymore. In fact, last week, I teach on Wednesday nights to the kids, and last week, I didn't tell you this, Brian, this is hilarious. <laughs> One of the kids said, I saw your picture on a poster, and I said, you did? And he said, yeah, and he said, when you were younger. <laughs> sad thing is that picture isn't that old, so I don't know. Anyway, um, so anyway, I took her to, to work, and this older woman, this no, ex, more experienced woman, let's, let's put it that way, um, she picked, babe, picked Lori up, and she said, this baby's hungry. If you feed this baby, she's going to be fine. And I explained to her, you know, the merry-go-round of formulas that we had her on. We just kept trying different things, and she said, no, 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 you got to give her something that sticks to her ribs. Well, that wasn't what the doctor was telling me, but I was willing to try anything. And so we got one of, it, one of those info feeders. Anybody remember them from way back when? They had a bigger hole than normal in the nipple, and when the, when the baby sucked on it, the, the bottom you know, pushed the food in. I guess they're still around, but I think at some point in time, somebody said that they were causing a whole generation of obese children, and they kind of lost their popularity. But it was a godsend for us. And so I mixed up some really runny rice cereal and gave it to her and she slept a blissful two hours, which we thought we'd found paradise in <laughs> two whole hours of sleep. It was awesome. Um, so anyway, then, uh, uh, and it was, it, it really was, oh, where's my, where's my clicker? Is this on, John? Are we up? Okay. So then I decided I'd start giving her baby food during the day and suddenly, this baby came to live with us. Where is she? <laughs> My computer's awake, dear. I did. <laughs> it's awake. You know, why is it technology is always the thing that doesn't work? It's plugged in here, yeah. This one? Oh. <laughs> That's not plugged in. That's not plugged in. Hey, well, how's you doing? Um, <laughs> you should be going in about a second. Well, now, he was supposed to take care of all of this before I got up here. So. There's my baby girl. Yeah. That's the baby that came to live with us. Here's another one. There she is. Happy, 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 happy. And just in the nick of time, because I was going back to school in August, and so uh, we needed to have a happy baby. <laughs> so my plans were back on track, and everything was rolling along just fine until Lori was nine months old, and she wasn't sitting up yet. Well, the doctor wasn't terribly concerned about it, but he sent us to a specialist just to be sure that there wasn't anything that they were missing. And um, he, he just because she, she didn't she didn't walk well she didn't sit up till she was 13 months old and she didn't walk until she was 20 month, 24 months old and so he uh, the doctor talked to us about possible reasons for it and potential treatments which included brain surgery um, brain surgery yeah you got to be kidding me on my baby <laughs> no and all i could think about was the fact that they were going to cut off all of that curly curly hair <laughs> but anyway so he um, he whisks us off to the hospital for a battery of tests, and they discovered that it, it wasn't, it was, her soft spot had closed, the fontanelle, that's what they call it. It wasn't supposed to close until she was 18 months old, um, but they determined that it wasn't a premature closing. Her brain, for whatever reason, wasn't growing properly, and so it wasn't stimulating the skull to grow. 
Um, so back, brain surgery averted, but now what? Um, they diagnosed her with microcephaly, which is, just means a smaller head, is what all it means. Um, and so now, now what? Well, we soon discovered how it was going to affect her development. She, as, like I said, she didn't sit up till she was 13 months, and she didn't walk till she was two. But this smile was perpetual. This was my baby. <laughs> she laughed at everything. She was happy pretty much with everything. I mean, that she was, she didn't get frustrated very easily. In fact, she problem solved like a champ. I loved sitting and watching her just problem solve. And so this all kind of fed into my illusion that my plans were still intact, my plans were still you know, going along um, as they should, and everything was gonna be fine. Well, now's probably a good time to share where John and I were spiritually. I grew up in a Christian home, and um, my mother was the church secretary, my dad was an elder, we were at the church every time the doors were opened, I went to vacation Bible school, church camp, uh, you know, knew, baptized when I was 13, I knew all of the church things that church kids were supposed to know. And then when I was a teenager, I discovered uh, one of the church elders was drunk on Saturday night and serving communion on Sunday morning. Well, in my impressionable teenage brain, this meant this, that church wasn't for me anymore, that it was a bunch of hypocrites and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I continued to go to church because that's what my family required of me. But when I went to college, I was like, I can do this on my own. You know, I still believed in God, but I just wasn't going to have anything to do with that hypocritical church. Again, my teenage brain. Now, John had an entirely different um, experience. He was adopted when he was five and uh, was in the Catholic faith for, uh, for a while. But due to some circumstances about age 11, um, that all came to, to a stop and they didn't really go anywhere at that point. He still, again, he still believed in God, but he was terribly certain that he was the only one that can control his life. So here we are, two just freakishly independent people trying to do everything on our own. Well, time marched on, and Lori's developmental blaze, b delays became more obvious. We put her in school when she was two, uh, became, it began to medicate her so she'd sleep more than two hours a night because it was getting to all of us. And, um, and she was, we, were, we discovered she was hyperactive, so it calmed her hyperactivity. Well, when she was four, John got a job here in Aurora, and so we moved here to Springfield. We thought this was in our plans, but we know all along that God wanted us to be here. This was where he was, he was leading us, but we didn't think so at the time. We thought it was all us. Well, after a year being at, at that particular job, um, we thought we were stable enough. We bought the house that we'd been renting. Um, we got up the courage to have another child, um, and Lori was in school. I was working for an accountant because I had decided <laughs> in my wisdom that I didn't want to be a teacher anymore. And nine years later, he opened the doors, and I got back into education where I belonged all along. But, you know, again, <laughs> my plan's not God's. Um, and then the bottom dropped out again. John's company got bought out by another, uh, another company, and all of the department heads were laid off or let go in some way. So here we were. No job, baby on the way, no insurance. Lori's not making the progress that we had hoped she'd be making in school. Dreams shattered, plans failed, rock bottom. And that's just where God wanted us to be, because it had to get that way before we would stop being so independent. That... Lori wasn't an easy child to raise, and I'm going to be honest, our marriage suffered under the demand sometimes. It was not an easy time for us. Um, and when I finally reached my tipping point, I realized I needed to get back into church. And so it hit me that when I got to heaven, God wasn't going to hold that gentleman in my youth accountable for what I had done. He was going to hold me accountable. And so I said, I got to get back into church. And through a bunch of coincidences, which I don't believe in coincidences, we wound up here at Parkview, and we've been here for 40, almost 40 years. Um, and, and I love this place. And, you're, and they, this place has become my support system. Yes, yes. I knew, I knew I needed that. Well, that's just a tiny part of my life. And if I told you the whole journey, we'd be here till next Tuesday, and I don't think you want to be here that long. But um, I think some of you would probably be really disappointed if I didn't tell some Lori stories. <laughs> I get a hallelujah back there. 
So <laughs> what these are, I mean, my, you see, my daughter grew up in spite of me and not because of me, because I did some really embarrassing things to her, not intentionally, of course, but um, she lived through it. And I, I kind of call in my mommy dearest stories because I'm kind of glad she doesn't read and write or we might, you know, have a bestseller out there or a movie or something. But the first time this happened, <laughs> we lived in Waynesville and we lived on a gravel road. And like I said, Lori didn't stay up until she was 13 months old, but we uh, bought her for her first birthday, we bought her a red flyer wagon. And so I would sit her in the wagon and I would put pillows all the way around her to, to prop her up and we would walk down the gravel road and, on, you know, just to get some fresh air and, and just to get some exercise. And I talked to her all the time. Uh, it all went in, very little came out until a very long time, but um, always talking to her. So I'm talking to her and we're walking down this gravel road and I look back to say something to her and she's not in the wagon. In fact, she's probably from here to the drum set, laying on her back on the top of a hump of gravel on the side of the road, waiting patiently for me to come back and get her. I, I felt really bad. She didn't care. I mean, like I said, she, she's a happy, happy baby, happy baby. Well, the second, <laughs> the next episode was at the mall. Um, she had a lazy eye. That it, it, we, at about the age of three, I think it was, was when it, um, when it crossed. And so I had to bring her up here to Springfield. We were still in Waynesville. I had to bring her up here to Springfield to go to a specialist. And so I thought, well, I'd taken the whole day off from school. So the mall had just, they had just um, opened a, a whole new section in, of, the, uh, the, of the mall. And so I thought, well, we'll just, we'll go and, you know, see what it's all about. And I had her dressed to the nines, you know, little dress and ruffly socks and, you know, patent leather shoes and the whole nine yards. And we're walking along. Now, this was back before disposable diapers were so popular. They were way too expensive for most of us. And so she had on a cloth diaper with the, the plastic panties. You all, some of you remember those little plastic panties. And we're walking down the mall, and I'm holding her hand. And, and she, by this time, she was well walking pretty well. And so that was you know, really cool that I could walk with her. So we're walking down the mall. I'm holding her hands. And people are staring at her. But they always did, because she had that curly, curly hair, that orphan Annie hair. And so I didn't think too much about it until I looked down to say something to her, and her diaper was down around her ankles. And she was desperately trying to keep up with me like this. <laughs> so I jerked her pants back up, and we exited them all as quickly as possible. But that wasn't the only time we did something embarrassing at the mall. <laughs> we, we, John and I took care of his grandmother for about 11 years. She lived in the house that was on the, uh, the street right behind us. And Saturdays were granny days. And we would take granny to, uh, to get her hair done or to the grocery store or wherever. And we just we spent Saturdays with granny. Well, we would go out to the mall because she got her hair done out there every once in a while. And we would just bop around the mall and wait for her to get done. So, so we were all there. Well, Lori loved wheelchairs. She still does <laughs> to this day. She still loves wheelchairs. But she, so we got her a little pink wheelchair that we would put her in. And um, when we had to do a lot of walking, because she's, she was still pretty awkward, well, she still is, but pretty awkward with her walking and would fall and couldn't do a lot of walking when we were doing a lot of it. And so we had her in, <laughs> we had her in the wheelchair and we had a, a seatbelt around her. <laughs> John, should I tell the grocery store story? <laughs> <laughs> we had her before we had a seatbelt to keep her in the wheelchair, which she didn't care, but it, it was just kind of a safety thing. But before we had the, before we had the seatbelt on the wheelchair, we had her at the grocery store one day, and John had her in an aisle, and she saw a piece of trash, which trash is her life. And she saw a piece of trash, and she jumped up out of the wheelchair and ran over and grabbed the trash, and then ran back and sat down. And she, John said people were looking at him like, what just happened? He said, I wanted to just drop to my knees and go, praise Jesus, she's healed. <laughs> but he didn't. <laughs> so so we, we put, had, she was in a seatbelt. Thank goodness she was in a seatbelt. Well, the boys and John and I were you know, walking down the mall and Jacob was beside me and he was probably four-ish, four or five. And um, we were kind of 
messing with each other, you know, tickling each other and everything. And I let go of the wheelchair and reached down to tickle Jacob. And we were at the top of a ramp. <laughs> yeah. Down goes Lori, speeding up as she goes. I'm yelling at Lori. John's yelling at me. The boys are embarrassed to, to death. Fortunately, it, it had a curve in it, had a turn in it. And so she hit the turn, <laughs> went up almost into the plants and stopped. <laughs> and so we decided maybe the mall wasn't for us at that point. But, <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you one more. And this one's for you, John Kendall. Are you listening? <laughs> this one's for you. <laughs> this one I don't tell very often. <laughs> but we, uh, like I said, we had Granny. And so when Granny got to the point where she needed a wheelchair too, we had to have a bigger vehicle because we had two wheelchairs now. And, you know, all these and six of us, you know, we, when we went anywhere. So we got this big black Suburban. And one day, we were, we were going somewhere, the boys and Lori and I, and we, we, I put Lori in the very, very back because she tended to pull hair. When she was in the middle, she would pull my hair and pull my hair and pull my hair and pull my hair until I thought I was going to die. And so we put her in the very back, and the boys were in the middle. Well, we're driving down the road, and I hear her saying, stuck, stuck, I stuck. And I'm like, what? And I said, Jeremy, look back there and see what's going on. So he looked back there, and he couldn't really tell anything. And I couldn't see her anymore, so her head was missing. And so, <laughs> I, so we pulled over into the parking lot, into a parking lot, and I told Jeremy, I said, well, get back there and help her get back up in her seat. Well, he went back there, but he couldn't, he couldn't get her up in her seat. And so I'm getting frustrated. I'm like, OK, OK, I'll just go do it myself. So I get out of the car, and I go back. I can't get her out either. Her leg is bent underneath the back seat, and there, there wasn't a lot of room back in that back seat. And her leg is bent back there, and she can't get out. But she's not crying. She's just, I stuck. <laughs> you know, yeah, I see that, baby. But so I, I'm like, what am I going to do? Well, I look down the road, and there's a fire station right down the road. <laughs> so I, we beat it to the fire station, and I'm knocking on the door, and these poor guys come to the door, and I'm like, I need your help. And so bless their hearts, they got her out. I don't know how they did it, but that's, that's their job, I guess. They know how to get people out of, out of sticky places. So, so I don't know, did they have to, would they have to write a report on that? <laughs> well, I, I really would have liked to have seen that report. <laughs> so anyway, I could go on. There's, there's lots more of them, but we learned to find the humor. In, in situations, because, you know, sometimes that was the only thing that was saving our sanity, was just finding the humor in those. Well, my purpose in telling you this small part of my life is, is that God did not allow Lori to be punished because we weren't where we should have been spiritually. She, she is who she was meant to be, but he did use, his, use her to get us to where we needed to be, and so that's been a real blessing for us. Well, through my life, he's, he has shown me three reasons why he will sometimes redirect and sometimes even cancel our plans. Now, there's a whole bunch more reasons, but I'm going to come up with three, because isn't that what supposed to, you're supposed to do, have three points? Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> okay, I was going to have four, but I didn't want to be an overachiever, so. No. Um, but... Uh, no, I've lost my train of thought. Preparation, <laughs> protection, and timing. And I couldn't think of a P, another P, but you know, you'll have to forgive me for that one. <laughs> so God may be preparing us for the future by redirecting our plans. Instead of seeing our plans as being taken from us, what if we looked at it as a time that he is giving us to prepare us for what he has for our future? Prime example in the Bible, Joseph. Now, I'm sure when Joseph got up that fateful morning, he had no idea he was going to wind up in a hole, get sold into slavery, and end up in prison. But God had, other, he had much bigger plans for Joseph. One that would land him as the right-hand man to Pharaoh, would eventually, um, and would ultimately save thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, including his own family. And what was the secret to his success? He trusted God. He was faithful, and he trusted that God's plans were okay, even when they didn't make any sense to him. Even when he was betrayed by his brothers and wrongfully accused, he never stopped believing that God had his back. And how about Esther? Let's talk about Esther for a minute. She was perfectly happy in Mordecai's house, but the Lord had other plans for her too. 
She wound up in a harem of virgins, getting a year's worth of beauty treatments and waiting for the king to decide who the next queen would be. Now, I'm sure that the palace was probably a pretty strange place for, um, for Esther because by all indications, she grew up um, probably you know, helping out in Mordecai's household and just being a, a humble Jewish woman. And here she was waiting to see if she would be the next queen. Uh, and sure enough, she, uh, I'm sure that in her wildest dreams, she never thought that she would be the queen, that she would expose a plan to kill all the Jews, and that she would wind up saving all of their lives. Although, and Esther only accomplished this because she laid down her fears, she accepted what her fate could have been, and she trusted that God's plan was worth, was worth risking everything for. Now, I've not had anything that dramatic happen in my life, but God's had to redirect me a few times. Given that I was determined to control my life, it's not surprising that Lori, that he used Lori to tell me how laughable that attitude was. Our plan for independence eventually brought us to total dependence on God, but only after he had to redirect us several times. He knew the future that he had planned for us, and he just needed us to get out of the way. So Jeremiah 29, 11 became my go-to when things were not going my way. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And notice he didn't, even, he didn't just say he was going to give us a, a future. He said he was going to give us hope and a future. And think about that. If, if there wasn't any struggles involved, there wouldn't be any reason for hope. So right there he's telling us, Things aren't going to be perfect, but I'm going to give you hope, and I'm going to give you a future. So that's pretty awesome. The secondly, God may be protecting us from things that we don't see. God knows what's best for us even when we don't see it. In fact, ruined plans are the perfect opportunity to show us that his concern is eternal and not earthly. He's all about showing his glory, and sometimes that involves patience and perseverance. Two words we're not very excited about asking God for because he's going to give them to us if we ask or he's going to see if we're really, if we're really uh, serious. Well, we can't see the big picture like God can and what, when we can't understand why things aren't going the way we, th- we had planned, we've got a choice. We can either trust that God knows what he's doing or we can take matters into our own hands and suffer the consequences. Let's take Abraham and Sarah. And I'm going to get a drink because my mouth's getting very dry. So take Abraham and Sarah. God had promised Abraham that he was going to have enough ancestors that would be more than the stars in the sky and the sand in the, on the beach and that sort of thing. But when old age started creeping in and, and the promise seemed to fade, Sarah decided that the promise was for Abraham and not for her. And so she convinced Abraham to have a child with Hagar, her slave. And that's where the drama began. Imagine how things might have been different if Abraham and Sarah had waited and waited for that promise to be fulfilled. The promise was eventually, it was eventually fulfilled, but not without consequences that have affected the whole, that affected whole nations and still can be felt today in the conflicts between the descendants of Isaac, and the, which was the promised son, and the descendants of Hagar, uh, Ishmael, which is the, uh, Hagar's son. Well, we never know the danger that might be just around the corner that God might protect, be protecting us from. A job opportunity that falls through, uh, a car trouble at an inopportune time, vacation plans that get canceled, um, a marriage or engagement that doesn't get fulfilled. Those can all be ways that God's directing a safer path for us. Well, he could, have, he could have an even more impactful and successful life, and I really believe that he has a successful life planned for all of us, and then we mess it up when we try to take control of the situation. And he can also reveal blessings he never expected when we accept his plan. Kind of an example of that, the summers were hard for Lori because she had to have some place to go every day. And she loved a routine, and when she didn't have any place to go, it really upset her and, and consequently the entire family because, you know, it, it was not pleasant. Well, I, so I made sure that she always had some place to go in the, summer, in the summertime. It was usually through, um, it was through the Developmental Center of the Ozarks or um, sometimes at the ARC, but I always made sure she had a summer program to go to. 
And then the boys and I would look forward to that because we could go and do all the things that we was a little harder to do with dragging Lori along. And so it was always a pleasant time for all of us. Well, one summer, the park board had, um, had announced that they were going, one of their programs, they were going to include um, special needs children. And so I thought, hey, you know, she'll get to do what normal kids do. So, you know, I signed her up. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, after a week, um, they informed us that they didn't have the personnel or the resources to accommodate her and that she couldn't come back. Well, all the other programs were full at this point because you really have to get those, you know, early, early slots. So here we were. Nah, she was going to be home for the summer. And we were all disappointed, including her, um, but we made them a, tried to make the best of it and just, you know, accepted it. Well, one particular day, um, I'm going to try to do this without crying, but I don't know that I've ever told this story without crying, so <laughs> bear with me. One, one particular day, um, we were sitting on the couch, and the TV was on, and she really usually didn't pay much attention to the TV, but something on the TV had caught her eye. And we're sitting next to each other, and she gets very quiet. And I thought, what's going on with her? So I turned to look at her, and it suddenly hit me how beautiful she was. And you know, when you're in the day-to-day -day demands of a special needs child, you don't look at those things. You're, you're too busy just trying to survive. And I looked at her and I thought, she really is <laughs> the beauty. And she caught me looking at her and she laid her head on my shoulder. Now, it was brief, because <laughs> she moves all the time, but very, very brief, but very impactful because she wasn't very verbal and she still is not terribly verbal. But um, in that moment, my heart heard, I love you, mama. And I will never forget that. And if my plans had worked out, I would have missed that. And I would have not had that special memory all these years later. And so we never know what exactly God might, what blessings he might have in store for us um, if we just trust that he knows what he's doing. Okay, I didn't, I didn't cry too much, so. Okay. Well, thirdly, God's timing is impeccable. Have you ever heard anybody say, I love to wait? <laughs> no, said nobody ever. Well, we live in an instant society, and having to wait for anything is often not a very pleasant thing. However, when we're considering God's planning for us, timing is everything. He wants us to be in the right place at the right time with the right mind. That's so important. Oh, what was that? Okay. Sometimes that takes minutes, sometimes it takes decades, but nothing can stop his plan from happening if we, if, when the time is right. Sometimes the delaying of our plans can make the outcome even more miraculous. It's when things seem the most impossible that gives God the chance to show up in mighty ways. What do you think God, why do you think God made Abraham wait 100 years and Sarah in her 90s before they received that promised son? It, often when things seem the most impossible, that God's power can be revealed and his perfect plan is the most displayed. How can we consider, not consider Jesus when we think about God's timing? My goodness. There was multiple opportunities for God's plan of salvation to get derailed, but absolutely nothing was going to stop God um, to get in the way of Jesus' sacrifice for us. And the timing had to be right. Now, Jesus' ministry didn't start till he was 30, and we don't really have a lot of information about what happened you know, in, during that time before. Um, by all indications, he lived a, just a humble, um, routine, daily life. But God knew who needed to be in top power, he knew the men that needed to be his disciples. He knew uh, whose hearts would be open to him, whose hearts would not be. It all needed to be an exact alignment, and it was. Well, when Lori was about 20, we put her name on a list for funding for an independent supported situation, or independent living situation. Now, I was nowhere near ready to let my baby go. I mean, my goodness, I had taken care of her all of her life. There it goes again. What am I doing? I don't know. Anyway, I'd taken care of her all my life, and nobody else could take care of her like I could. 
And so I'm like, okay, but they said it could take years. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm okay with that as long as it takes years. Um, but because my plan was for her to stay with me forever. Um, but it took seven years for that call to come. And when it did, every, it took every ounce of my being not to turn it down, but John wouldn't let me. <laughs> and he'd convinced me that this was the best thing for her. And I have to agree, he was right. Yes, dear, you did hear me say that you were right. <laughs> yeah. Mark it on the calendar. Um, so miraculously, all these things fell into, I, had, I made a bargain with God. I said, you know, all these, these things have to, have to you know, happen before I'm going to let her go. And then miraculously, all those things fell into place. And so I had to say, okay, God, I'm going to let her go. And now she lives in an independent living home. She loves her house. It's uh, been the, the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's been the most positive thing for her and for us. Um, like I said, she lives in an independent supporting living house. She loves her roommate. who They have literally known each other since they were toddlers. That was another big God thing, that this happened to be the one spot that they had open was this spot with this young lady that they have known each other since they were little bitty. Um, so, and she has the best staff in the world and the best organization, I feel. It's just Nova Center of the Ozarks. I think they're the best. And uh, so it, all things fell into li in line. That was another bargain that it had to be them. Uh, but all things fell in line. I had to let her go. She comes home every Sunday and one weekend a month. Um, and I have to tell you that because we're not dealing and bogged down in that day-to-day -day care of her, we enjoy her so much more. And we would have never had that if I had kept her with me all my life. Um, she's happier. She has a much fulfilled life than she would have if she had stayed home with us. And so we would have missed out on all of that had I insisted my plans be over what God wanted. And you know what? She's the lucky one. She's never had to deal with the stresses of a normal life. And this is what not carry, trying to carry the weight of the world around looks like at 44. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> That's my girl. She's happy for the most part. She's content with very little. She doesn't hold grudges. She finds pleasure in the simplest of things. Doesn't that sound like what the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to be like? So sometimes you know what the society looks at as abnormal is really much closer to what God says we should be than, than what our normal life is. Well, I'm an incurable educator, so I want to conclude with the ABCs of what I consider the how-to of turning our lives over to God, to God's plans. So A is acceptance. Sometimes we just have to accept that God knows what he's doing, even when he doesn't make sense to us. Surrendering your own agenda and acknowledging your dependence on God will bring you perfect peace. Isaiah 26.3 says, You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Because God is at work in our lives, all the hardships can strengthen our faith. And out of this can come a deeper relationship with God. And the byproduct can be peace and contentment. B is biblical viewpoint. God's reason for interrupting our plans may have an even greater purpose. It may be that your own bad choices have caused you to need a course correction, or it may be through no fault of your own, and the enemy's trying to derail you. But God can use the situation to bring him glory. His focus, again, is on the permanence of eternity and not on the temporary. Change your perspective. Look at opportunities to help others. And, or look at opportunities to grow. Anticipate what God's going to do, even if he chooses a plan that's different from your own. He may be asking you to let go. Ouch. That's a hard one. C is for commitment. Wherever God puts you, commit to being the best you can be for the kingdom. Find ways to take your focus off your troubles. Concentrate on helping others. Sometimes the purpose of your struggles may be just as much for other people than it is for you. There's a Casting Crown song called Desert Road, and the chorus goes like this. I don't know where this is going, but I know who holds my hand. It's not the path I would have chosen, but I'll follow you to the end. Lord, as long as I'm breathing, I will make your glory known, even if it means I'm walking on this desert road. You know, when the Lord is moving us into the, into the wilderness, he has plans in the desert. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather go someplace with God than to go somewhere without him. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, The Lord himself goes before you. He will never leave you, nor you forsake you. 
Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. So wait for him. Trust him. Keep your sense of humor and, and uh, be at peace knowing that God's still in control. He knows what's best for you and he will accomplish his plan if you let him. Thank you for listening to me today. And Oh, goodness. Oh, do you want us all to cry, Bill? <laughs> do we have time for another story? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> there was a time when Lori became obsessed with baptism. And she'd say, ties, ties, ties. And she would point to the, bap the baptistry, ties, ties, my turn, my turn, my turn. And she would hold her nose and turn, 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 that ties, ties. Well, you know, we knew she didn't really understand what it meant. And so we didn't think it was right to, you know, to have her baptized. But the pastor at the time, which was Jim Haining, he said, what have you got to lose? You think God's going to be mad if you baptize her? And she doesn't really even, you know, she doesn't completely understand it. He said, for whatever reason, she knows it's important and she wants it done. So I'm like, okay, I can't argue with that. <laughs> so we did. Um, we, we baptized her. Uh, well, her daddy baptized her. And the, I'm telling you, there was more people here in the church that afternoon <laughs> than there were that Sunday morning. Um, but it was, it was such a special time. And the next Sunday, she sat back there and she looked at me and she pointed to the baptistry and she said, Naomi ta turn, Naomi turn, which Jeremy was her brother. Naomi turn. I said, yeah, Jeremy's had a turn. Dano turn, Dano turn, Jacob, it's Jacob Daniel, and he was in trouble all the time, so she called him Dano. <laughs> Dano turn, Dano turn, yeah, ja Dano's had a turn. Mommy turn, yeah, mommy's had a turn. Daddy turn, yeah, mom, daddy's had a turn. And she stopped talking about it from then on. She wanted to make sure we were all had a turn. And, and I mean, she still acknowledges the baptism, uh, the baptismal uh, at times, but yeah, such a special, such a special time. So that's for you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We're going to sing a song here, but when we do, um, this is also a time just to spend some time between you and the Lord. You can do that right where you are. You can spend some time between you and the Lord, and you can thank Him for reminding you of so many important things that Sharon has shared with us tonight. But also, if, if you have something that you'd like prayer for tonight, if you'd like to just come forward and have a moment between you and the Lord, or you'd just like to have someone pray over you, or to give you some encouragement, while we're singing that song, um, you're invited to the front, and, uh, and we'll pray for you. And uh, put an arm around you, and uh, we'll just spend this time with the Lord. So we're going to stand, we're going to sing, and I invite you, if you'd like to, to come forward and to spend this time with the Lord. The more I seek you, the more I find you. Oh, 
than I can stand. I'm melting your peace. It's overwhelming. Your love is overwhelming me. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hands, lay back against you and breathe. Fill your heart so good to be together, so good to uh, just pray for one another and just to be encouraged. God, we thank you for Sharon and John and you know, we've watched their lives, we've watched we've watched their love for Lori and we just thank you for them for the testimony of, of how you direct and guide our paths. And I just praise you for their lives and for bringing them here to this body. Father, we want to be in your presence. We want to live in your will. We want to live knowing that we're following your plan, God. Give us the, the strength to do that, the strength to trust you today. May we be a church that trusts you. May we be a church that follows you and that lives our lives in communion with you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Well, I have to say thank you to Sharon. That was wonderful, every part of it, beginning to end. Um, we're going to do the door prizes. Um, before, I, before we do that, there are raffle tickets in the back if anybody wants to buy them for the quilt. Um, can you do that now and then I'll do these? The quilt, the money for the quilt is going to the Sunday evening ladies group. Okay, so if you want to do that and then I'll get them afterwards. So if you would take out your orange pretty tickets. Where's my elf? My elf? Casey. <laughs> Actually, Sharon, can you by any chance help me with this? And pick them out and I'll call them and then so you would just take one of those. <laughs> my little elf. Okay, the first one. Five two zero 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 seven. Oh, so you get to bring one. Take that one. Next one is five one nine eight three eight. Over there. Is that mine? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> My ticket was sitting over there. Oh, but it's right up there. Five one nine nine seven six. Five one nine nine seven six. Five one nine eight four zero. Back there. Five one nine nine eight five. <laughs> Stacy. Five one nine 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 two. Up oh, right there. Five two zero 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 eight. Five two zero 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 eight. Okay. Uh. Five one nine nine eight two. Five one nine nine eight two. Judy. Five two zero zero one three. Oh, who said that? Oh, I didn't even know you were here. Five one nine eight three one. Five one oh, over there. Oh, yeah. She'll raise her hand for you. And the last one. And the last one goes to. Five one nine nine eight four. Right there. Yay. So we'll do the um where'd Debbie go? Oh. Sharon, would you mind picking one for the quilt? No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. I will I will tell you that last year John won the quilt. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to buy a replica. What does that say? 310392. 310392. Oh, right here. Wow. Carolyn. 310392. Carolyn. Okay. Yay. Okay, the last thing that I would like to do is to present this basket to Miss Sharon for doing what she did today. And to say thank you to everybody for coming, the people that have helped me to make this successful, um, people that brought desserts. And there are desserts in the back, lots of them. Um, 
cookies. There. Debbie's doing one of these to tell them eat. So go back and eat on your way out. Take some home with you. There's coffee back there, water. Um, and hopefully we'll do this again next spring. All right. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Who tells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory. to widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, he saved me from who I was, cause that's what Jesus does. Who understands the heart of the sinner, showers his grace over all our mistakes, washes us clean with his blood, Jesus does. Who gave us the Son and praise to the Spirit who's living in us? When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus does. Oh, what a friend! Oh, what a Savior! He's always been good, He's always been faithful. To my rescue when I needed him most and saved my soul. Oh, what a friend! Oh, what a savior! He's always been good, he's always been faithful. Came to my rescue when I needed him most and saved my soul. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son and praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was, cause that's what Jesus does, yes He does. Sorry about trying to end that early.